Good evening, and welcome to the Marian Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Henrietta Toivonen, and I'm one of the Ath Fellows this year. Our speaker tonight, Susan Sert, has focused on the topics of suffering, illness, health, and death throughout her career. All of these concepts are an integral part of human life, with interrelated connections at different stages of our existence. They are they are experienced individually, but also at the level of society. Understanding these experiences, whether, um, whether in the individual or, or collective context, can, can be done from many perspective, perspectives, from religion and anthropology to social sciences and history. These are the disciplines that Professor Sert explores in her work at the Suffolk University in Boston, where she is a professor of sociology and a senior researcher at the University's Center for Women's Health and Human Rights. Previously, she directed a research program in religion, health, and healing at Harvard University's Center for the Study of World Religions. She has conducted an extensive field research um, on, criminal, on criminalized women in Massachusetts and has written extensively on this topic. She's also interested in a wide range of other issues within the areas of gender, religion, illness, and healthcare. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual record recording is strictly prohibited. Please join me in welcoming Professor Sard to the Athenaeum. Hello, and I just want to say what a pleasure it is to be here, and I appreciate um, the Athenaeum staff and associates for inviting me. I've had a lovely day here in California and the sunshine, which um, <laughs> I needed. I have an, a horrible, horrible cold and bronchitis, which is a, an occupational hazard of hanging out with people in homeless shelters and jails. I'm just sick all the time. Um, so um, that's actually how I morphed from being a medical anthropologist to working with criminalized women, um, that I, I realized that prisons are our largest repository of um, sick people in the United States. There's a lot of attention to mental illness and incarceration, um, but the rates of physical illness are as high, if not higher. Um, incarcerated populations have higher rates of almost every physical illness that you can think of than the general population, whether it's arthritis, cancer, the whole gamut of things. Um, when I first entered this field, and I, which was about 10 years ago, um, I was coming off of a national study of um, the experiences of Americans without health insurance. And I um, was wondering what happens to people when their health deteriorates to the point they can't work anymore. And um, so I started to think about prisons, and I read a lot about prisons being incubators for infectious diseases and diseases like tuberculosis that were rare in the general population were just spreading like wildfire through prisons. And I found one study that had been done um, in a women's prison of um, health at intake coming into the prison and their health was already far worse than that of the general population. So yes, prison makes people sick, but being sick is actually a risk factor um, for being incarcerated, which is an upsetting thing to say. Um, is, is the volume good, or should I move the mic closer? Good volume, okay. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about the project that I've done, but I'm gonna begin just very quickly with some brief stats. Um, I know that many of you know these stats, so I'm not gonna dwell on them too much. Um, I think one of the more interesting points here is that um, even with the highest incarceration rate in the world, that doesn't come near to the number of people who are under some form of correctional supervision. So many of those people cycle in and out of jails and prisons. Um, some things that, again, I'm sure many of you know, and I'm going to try to save my voice by not <coughs> reading what's on the slides. But um, 
I think it's important to point out that in the past couple of years, there's been some optimism that incarceration rates are going down, um, but incarceration rates for women are going up. Um, I think there's complex reasons for why that's happening. I think part of it is market driven. This was just a, an untapped market for prisons. And um, so I just want to give you a minute to read this slide. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our study. Um, it started almost 10 years ago. As I said, I was coming off of a large national study of the experiences of Americans who don't have health insurance. And I had recently begun to work at Suffolk University in Boston. Um, and in my sociology department at Suffolk, the most popular concentration is uh, crime and justice studies. And most of our faculty are interested in things having to do with criminology. So I wanted to have friends in the department. And I looked around for a project that would work for me and that maybe I could collaborate with somebody. And um, one of the more veteran members of the department, Maureen Norton Hawk, had been working with women in prostitution for many years. So she and I did a short study. Um, it was an interesting study. We um, um, interviewed women who had just come out of prison and were in a halfway house that they'd been placed at. They had gotten early release from prison. And um, we took extensive, extensive sort of life histories from these women. We sat with each of them for hours and hours and hours. And um, we came away from that with more questions than answers. And um, we began to understand that these women going to prison wasn't a sudden event in their lives, that there was a long trajectory of all kinds of misery and suffering in their lives. So um, we decided to launch a five-year study in which we would follow women post-incarceration and try to track what goes on in their lives in those years post-incarceration. Um, there had been a lot of research on recidivism among men, very little research on recidivism among women, and at least in Massachusetts, which, which in many ways is an outlier um, in terms of health care and in terms of a lot of other things, I don't even know what recidivism means. Recidivism means that you got caught doing that thing again, but that doesn't measure whether people are actually still doing that bad thing that got them sent to prison to begin with. So um, we knew that um, from the statistics, um, the Department of Corrections in Massachusetts, that um, incarceration rates for women peaked in their mid to late 30s. And by the mid 40s, there were very few women incarcerated. And no one knew why. No one knew what was happening to these women. Studies with men. Um, suggested that this tapering off in incarceration rates has to do with young men and crazy risk behavior. So young men do all this stupid ass stuff and you know they steal cars and they think it's all really cool and by the time they're in their 40s they've already served their term and they're done and they really have no desire to go back to the streets. But um, that didn't seem to be the life trajectory for women. There seemed to be other things that were thrusting them into the prison system. <coughs> so just as a little side note, we, um, you know, we were sort of interested in where are women who were incarcerated five years later, 10 years later, 15 years later. Um, so a little side study that we did, we got the, the names and aliases and um, basic demographic information and all of the women released from the one Massachusetts state prison in 1995. And um, we then went through the death records, um, one by one. <laughs> it was very time intensive. And about 18% of them were dead. So a lot of the disappearing of women from prison by the time they're in their mid 40s is that they're dead. Um, but the fact that they're not being reincarcerated is generally heralded as a great success. They, <laughs> there was no recidivism. Um, so we were seeing that things were more complicated than the literature would suggest and certainly more complicated than any public policy suggested. So um, you saw on this slide the basic demographics of the women in the study. Um, these were the, the charges for incarceration. And the most common charge 
for their last incarceration was violation of probation or parole. So that means that the thing they were actually arrested for was not deemed serious enough for them to be incarcerated. But then um, they failed to pay court fees, they failed to show up for a meeting with a parole officer, they had a dirty urine, they were picked up on literally um, a jaywalking charge. One woman was picked up on a littering charge um, and that was what actually sent them into prison. <coughs> so this slide just lays out their health challenges. I think that the um, back problems is really interesting. Um, so five years down the line, and I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we carried out the study. Our original idea was that we recruited women at this one particular halfway house and we explained to them that this is a five-year commitment and you know we're gonna get in touch with you every three months and we wanna hear about how you've been doing and your family and your work and your living situation. And um, <coughs> we quickly realized that if we wait three months, we're never gonna find these women again. That to find people who are homeless and have aliases and are mentally ill and have substance use issues, you have to be in almost daily touch with them. So it morphed from this very structured, we're gonna meet with them four times a year kind of study to a much more ethnographic study of just hanging out with the women. Um, so um, of the 47 women, um, half of them were still in the project at the end, which is absolutely phenomenal. It's just the best retention rates we've seen anywhere in the literature. And um, you know, we can attribute those good retention rates to a couple of factors. I tend to attribute it to the bathrooms in the building that I teach in at Suffolk University. Um, if you're homeless, a clean, quiet, private bathroom is incredibly valuable. Um, at a lot of the homeless shelters, they've taken the stalls off of the doors of the toilets because they don't want people shooting up drugs or having sex in the stalls. So there's just no privacy to go to the bathroom and the bathrooms are dirty and they're disgusting and there's long lines to get into the bathroom. The homeless shelters generally kick everybody out by eight in the morning so you have to get up at five in the morning to even get into the bathrooms. And um, my office is in this really, really nice building. And it's right in downtown Boston near one of the big parks where a lot of people who don't have another place to go hang out. Um, the security guard in our building um, had a, has a sister who's struggled with um, criminalization and drug issues. So he was very sympathetic to the project. I mean, his job was to keep people like this out of the building. But, you know, a woman could come staggering into the lobby and say, there's this lady here I talk to sometimes. And he would know to send her up to my office. So a lot of people contributed to the success. A big part of the success and retention was that the uh, Massachusetts Transit Authority donated monthly mass transit passes. Um, it's hard for us to understand how valuable a mass transit pass is to someone who's precariously positioned. <coughs> we realized that that's the incentive we wanted to give women when we were hearing from a number of women that they got out of prison and they were given a train ticket that would get them to downtown Boston. But then to get on the subway to get home, they didn't have money. and cover your ears if you don't like the language. They were giving blow jobs to the guys at the T station, at the train station to get home. So we realized that giving out the T passes, the, the mass transit passes would be really valuable. Also, anyone who survives on the institutional circuit of food stamps and shelters and all this other stuff has hundreds of um, appointments that they have to go to. And if you don't have money to take the bus or the train to get to the appointment, you get in trouble for not going to the appointment. Um, so I think that was another really valuable thing in the project that we gave the monthly mass transit passes. And at least demographically, there was no significant difference between the women who left and the women who remained. So five years later, of the 26 women who remained, um, 
These are pretty dismal figures. Only nine of them were securely housed for most of the five years. Only four of them were steadily employed for most of the five years. Um, but most of them didn't go back to prison, so they're counted as successes because there was no recidivism. 15 of the 26 were assaulted over the five years. Um, so I'm not gonna read this out loud, I'll save my voice. You can take a look at these numbers. Um, when the study came to an end at the end of the five years, we told the women that um, we don't have the mass transit passes anymore, but we'll still be here. And as I said, our office is located right in downtown Boston. And please stop by, call, we'd love to stay in touch with you. And um, I, I remember one woman saying to me that um, the five-year study was the first thing she'd ever finished in her life. And she was so proud of it. Um, so at this point, I'm still in, so the study ended about two and a half years ago. I'm still in touch with about a dozen women. So you could see some of the numbers on this slide. And um, I've made references to the institutional circuit. Um, the women utilize incredible numbers of public services and it's hard to get your mind around the number of different public services they use and um, you can read through this list um, I think the most important sentence here is that typically each woman uses several different programs or facilities of each type so um food pantries are a really good example um, most food pantries don't give a person who comes to get food enough food to last them until the next time they're eligible to get food at the food pantry. So if you're actually gonna feed your family with food from food pantries, you need to go to a whole bunch of different food pantries. So one woman in the study, um, this is, are you able to read the font, is that working? So this is a list of Program services and facilities for the year 2010. I'll just leave it up for a second. For you. <coughs> Go to the next one. Yes, no? Hold on, okay. My glasses on, so. And this is part two. This is an astronomical number of services and programs. Um, I think one of the things that's really interesting here is um, the number of detoxes. One of the things that happens in Massachusetts, and I know it happens in California as well, that people are sent to or voluntarily go to detoxes which last for five to seven days, but then afterwards they're back out on the streets. There's nowhere to go after that. So they just keep cycling through the detoxes every, t you know, every couple weeks, every couple of months. Um, in Massachusetts, there's been a, a very big spike in the past year in um, um, opio opioid related deaths. And um, the Massachusetts state government is just in a complete panic about it. They've started a whole task force and why are so many people all of a sudden um, overdosing on prescription pain medication and on heroin? And um, one of the women in the project said to me that she thinks the reason is that because there's this panic going on right now, people are being picked up much more or being sent by their families to detox. And when they come out of detox, their tolerance is lower. So they take the same quantity of drugs they were taking before detox, but now they're dying from them. So I don't think that's the whole story, but I think it's at least a part of the story. And I think it's a dramatic example of how this churning and cycling um, is really expensive, really ineffective, and actually dangerous. So one of the things that so intrigues me is that um, as many people, and I think California has been a leader in this, are starting to feel that we in America incarcerate too many people. The new mantra that I'm hearing is, 
that these people that we're locking up, they're not criminals, they're sick. They need treatment, not punishment. Um, but in Massachusetts, unlike in most of the rest of the country, and for women, I don't think it's so true for men, um, they cycle through therapeutic facilities even more than they cycle through punitive facilities. So the women that I know, and you saw this on the list of all the programs and services that that one woman had used in a period of a year, um, they're going to both helping and punishing institutions. But I think that there's a coherent ideology that runs through all of these institutions, whether the ostensible goal is to punish somebody for committing a crime or to treat somebody for being sick. And the ideology that I see throughout the institutional circuit is the notion that the source of problems lies within the individual. And it's because of personal flaws that people end up in bad situations, that the individual must accept personal responsibility for their bad situation. And this ideology is expressed, in my opinion, through three interconnected social processes. Medicalization, which is a term that I'm sure you've heard, criminalization, and spiritualization. <coughs> so medicalization is a concept that sociologists use a lot. You know, it's the idea of interpreting some kind of social phenomenon in medical terms. So you know, one of the classic um, examples of medicalization is homosexuality. So there was a time over 100 years ago when homosexuality was seen as a sin. And then there became a period in which it was seen as a kind of psychological deviance. And so the goal was to cure the homosexuality. And you know, still now there are therapists who specialize in curing homosexuality. Um, prostitution has also been medicalized um, with the idea that women who go into prostitution have something wrong with them and they need treatment. Um, so I mean, a lot of phenomena are medicalized in our culture. Um, another example that's often given in, in uh, medical sociology courses is um, body shape and body size and facial features. Americans spend astronomical sums of money on plastic surgery and on all kinds of treatments to make their bodies better. And um, so it's sort of moving into a medical institution in order to address something that maybe in another situation, at another time, in another society, um, would not have been seen as a medical problem. So criminalization is a word that's used less often, but I think it's a really important concept. Um, <coughs> and the thing that's so important to, to me to understand, um, coming from my perspective as an anthropologist, is that um, what's considered bad behavior or inappropriate or unacceptable behavior really varies from society to society. And even within the same societies varies over time. And the easiest example that I can give you is that, you know, hop on a plane, go to Colorado, and marijuana is not illegal. Um, so whether some activity or some behavior um, is seen as a criminal behavior varies over time varies from place to place. Prostitution is seen as criminal behavior in the United States. It's not, it's not criminalized in Holland. Um, so <laughs> just as medicalization puts enormous power in the hands of medical experts, criminalization places enormous power in the hands of um, law enforcement, um, courts, and correctional personnel to manage these individuals. But here's the term that I introduce into this whole story, and this is kind of my, my little piece of it, um, spiritualization, um, which is addressing um, and interpreting a social problem in spiritual terms, invoking moral, cosmic, theological, mythical, karmic, or soul-related ideologies. Ideologies means histories or causes, and turning to religious experts to save individuals. Um, so the prime example of spiritualization that I would share with you is um, Alcoholics Anonymous. 
um, which is a religious program. It's a spiritual program. Um, they, Alcoholics Anonymous, several decades ago, made a purposeful decision not to use the word religious. They felt it would be more problematic. It would turn people away and it could get them into legal trouble. So they used the word spiritual. Um, you know, one person's spiritual is another person's religious. These are not terms that we can sort out in test tubes and laboratories. Um, so the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, why is this so important? This is so important because this is the dominant ideology in the entire institutional circuit. In many prisons, the only programming that's available is 12-step programming. In many homeless shelters, the only programming that's available is 12-step programming. And in many medical and therapeutic settings, participation in 12-step programs is a required part of the therapeutic process. In other words, doctors, psychotherapists, and correctional officers have all somewhat abdicated their responsibility for addressing the problems of inmates and patients and given that authority to 12-step programs. Um, so interestingly, I was at a hearing at the Massachusetts State House just last week, and um, one of the state reps who I think is one of the best state reps, she's been on the mental health committees for years, she's a licensed psychologist and she's very progressive, she's one of the people who supports a lot of the legislation that I think is really good legislation, and um, so she came in to introduce a bill that would make um, substance abuse tr treatment available in all prisons in Massachusetts. And she said to the Judiciary Committee, but don't worry, this is not going to cost the state a cent because all of the treatment is going to be provided by the recovery community. And the recovery community means the 12-step community. Um, so as I've been blabbering, I hope you've been looking at the screen and you've seen the first um, six steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, these steps are very religious sounding. Um, you know, we can talk about ways of defining religion, but when we have these higher powers, um, one of the things that really um, makes me laugh is in the many, 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 many zillions of conversations that I've had with people in the recovery community in which I've talked about issues around separation of church and state, um, particularly when in drug courts, judges mandate participation in 12-step programs, and these are religious programs. They'll say, no, no, we're not religious, we're not religious, but you're talking about God. No, no, uh, higher power. Anything can be your higher power. It doesn't have to be God. It can be that chair over there. Now, here's what's funny about it. I've heard that exact same sentence. It could be that chair over there so many times that I see that as a ritual statement. It's not a spontaneous idiosyncratic statement. Um, I think that another piece that's really important in this sort of spiritualization <coughs> in the 12-step programs is um, this encouraging of the individual to admit that they're flawed, that the problem is me, I screwed up. Um, I think that number 12 is really an important statement because what it says is we're missionaries, that we have an obligation to spread this message. And um, for a lot of states right now that are facing budget crises and have prisons that are filled with people who make large use of mood enhancing and um, mind changing substances, it's very tempting to have all this free labor available. Um, you don't need to hire therapists, you don't need to hire job counselors if you have free volunteers of missionaries from the recovery community. So here are some of the slogans that I see and what's so important to emphasize here is that I see these slogans on the walls of jails and prisons and halfway houses and homeless shelters. 
Um, I think the first one is particularly interesting. We have a disease that tells us we don't have a disease. What that really means is that if you say that you don't have a disease, you're in denial. As a matter of fact, I often hear from the women that I've worked with, denial is a river in Egypt. None of these women have any idea what that means. They don't know where Egypt is. They don't know what the Nile is. But this is one of the ritualized statements they hear at 12-step meetings. Number two particularly concerns me, the idea that God never gives you more than you can handle. I spent most of the morning today, that's one of the reasons I'm particularly hoarse, on the phone with a woman in the study. Um, uh, the book based on the study is available in the lobby outside. And, um, I also have a blog in which I post updates on the women's lives. So this is a woman I call Katya in the book. Um, Katya's life started out in a pretty crappy way. Um, her mother's um, second husband, her, her mother was white and her second husband was black. And um, her mother had a child from the first husband and then Katya and her brother with her second husband. and. Um, her mother's family was very racist, and Katya has memories of they're going to the grandparents' house for Sunday dinners, and the sister from the first marriage would sit at the table in the dining room, and she and her brother sat on the floor in the hall, and that's where they ate. But that was the tip of the iceberg. The bigger problem was that from the time that she was about eight, um, her mother would shoot her and her brother up with heroin and rent them out to men to have sex with them. Um, the best thing in her life was when she was 12, she ran away to New York City, and um, one of the big um, Puerto Rican gangs, the leader of the gang, heard about this 12-year-old girl who carried a razor blade around in her mouth to protect herself, and thought that was really cool, and she was adopted by the gang. So she had a couple of good years with the protection of the gang, um, was dealing drugs, and then as she says, I became my own best customer, and her life went downhill, if you can even imagine that from there. I mean, her life has been just one horror after another. Um, when I first met her, which is now eight years ago, she was pregnant. It was a result of a rape. Um, but shortly after that rape, she met a very nice man um, who has some of his own problems. Let me just say that. He's not a paragon of virtue, but he's not violent. He's not horrible. And um, she's a devout Catholic. She would not have an abortion. She wanted to have the baby, and the man wanted to adopt the baby, and they would raise the baby together. So I was with her through that pregnancy. I was with her in the hospital when she had that baby, and I've seen what a wonderful mother she is. And a couple years later, she had another baby. Now, she has other children who were taken away from her, but she felt that she had turned her life around, and she was raising these children and really, really, really on track. Um, I saw what she went through to get housing. In order to get housing, you have to work through the shelter system. You can't get eligibility for subsidized housing just by not having housing. You have to enter the shelter system. So a couple years ago, she was placed in what's called a, shatter, a scatter shelter. You've probably seen these on the sides of highways. These are these kind of hotels for long-term, I don't know, they're called like, long hotel USA or something, but there are sort of cheap hotels on the sides of highways that people can live in for long periods of time. So in states that don't have enough room in actual shelters, they'll put homeless families in these scatter shelters. So she did a year in the shelter on the side of the highway with no public transportation in one room with her two daughters. And you know, she paid her dues doing that and then she was moved to a shelter in a, that was a real shelter, and then she finally got her housing, and she has you know, a two-bedroom apartment with the man who's now her husband and the two girls. Um, and um, this summer, the girls were at day camp, and it's exactly what happened isn't clear to me, but somehow one of the counselors at the day camp called up child welfare services and said that one of the kids had come to camp in dirty clothes. So child welfare services came to investigate. And first of all, I don't believe the kids had dirty clothes. Her apartment's always a mess, but the kids are always immaculate. But whatever, put that in brackets. Um, 
So when someone from child welfare came to talk to her, um, that person claimed that her speech was slurred and she was high and took the kids away from her. She's on methadone. She goes to the methadone clinic every morning. She's been on methadone for years. Right after she gets her methadone dose, she's a bit dozy. Everyone is. That's just how it works. And yeah, she was not high on drugs. She was just having normal way of being right after getting her methadone dose. She's also on some psychiatric medication which interacts with the methadone. And she told that to the child welfare worker and she had the prescription from her psychiatrist. It didn't matter, her kids were taken and um, she's now in a battle to get them back. So God never gives you more than you can handle. Tell that to Katya. Um, Thank you. And how much more time do I have here? Pardon me? Could, I don't have my watch. Can anyone tell me what the time is like? Seven so how much more time do I have? Pardon me? OK. OK. So um, yeah. So the part of the serenity prayer that the women generally know is just the first part. God grant us the serenity to accept the things that we cannot change. And I see that in the programs that they go to, they're actively discouraged from being involved in any kind of activism to try to get better services or more rational policies. So here are just some of the comments that the women have made about involvement in 12-step programs. Again, I'm not going to read it out loud. Enough time? So I thought the last comment on this slide is particularly interesting. So I'm mean, coming full circle, you know, medicalization, criminalization, and spiritualization, they have a long history of intertwining. And I think the example of homosexuality is a really good one. Uh, you know, kind of homosexuality is a sin homosexuality is a crime, homosexuality is a pathology, and we still have these competing views. There are still churches that are involved in, you know, pray the gay away. Um, so I, I think it's interesting how they intertwine. And, you know, I think that the thread that runs through these three social processes um, is a thread that places the onus for suffering on the individual rather than on society. Um, so I want to just tell an interesting story here about suffering. Um, uh, so I was speaking to some of the students here who had asked how I choose my research topics and it got me thinking about how I choose my research topics. Um, so. One of my first projects many, 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 many years ago um, was in Israel, and I um, was interested in, re in religion. Actually, my actual formal PhD is in history of religions. And um, I was doing field work with elderly Jewish women who had moved to Israel from Kurdistan in the early 20th century. And these women had nothing going for them. They were women in a patriarchal society they were non-literate in a society that esteems education. This is the people of the book. And I mean, these women can kiss the book, but they can't read anything that's in the book. They were old in a society that worships the young, healthy, strong body. Um, they were poor, they were dark-skinned. They had every social strike against them that existed. And so in some ways, they're similar 
to the criminalized women that I work with in Boston, so this is where the story starts to come together. Um, not only are both groups of women kind of on the bottom of every social ladder that you can think of, I mean, most of the women in our project in Boston, and they're, they're typical of criminalized women around the country, struggled in school. A third of them were in special ed when they were in school. I mean, just at the bottom of every ladder, um, including the sexual abuse. So um, when I entered the field of studying um, you know, kind of the religious ritual lives of Kurdish women, I had read the classic book written by a folklorist, and he'd had a whole chapter on wedding songs and wedding rituals, and that these weddings were so joyous and the celebrations went on for two weeks. Well, when I interviewed <coughs> the Kurdish women, no one wanted to talk about their weddings. They remembered the wedding as the worst day of their lives. And as a matter of fact, the one wedding song that they told me was a song that goes something like this. I'm not going to sing it. Um, an older sister who's already married saying to the younger sister, don't bother running away into the forest. They're going to come and catch you and drag you back anyway. Because girls were married off at the age of 10 or 11 or 12 and sent to live in their husband's families. That's what we would call child sexual abuse in the year 2015 in the United States. So in a sense, the Kurdish women were sexually abused just like the women in my study, but the Kurdish women were not miserable. They weren't dysfunctional. They weren't turning to large amounts of medication to dull physical and emotional pain. So kind of what was the difference? And I think that a big part of the difference is that and this is maybe trivializing something that's much grander. The Kurdish women, and I, when I met them, most of them were, were elderly, could say, men are horrible. We women suffer. The women in my Boston study, what they say is, I personally am screwed up. I keep choosing the wrong men. My social worker says that to me. She says, why are you always choosing the losers? And I think there's a real difference in understanding one's own misery and suffering in a social context and understanding it as a result of one's own individuals, one's own individual <coughs> flaws and failures. So um, where I kind of see medicalization, criminalization, and spiritualization coming together I think the perceived dichotomy of treating versus punishing reflects an inability or unwillingness to look beyond the grand narrative of individualism for the causes and solutions to suffering. Um, I think I'm going to stop here. I know it's a little bit before the time that the formal lecture has to stop, but I've touched on a lot of big issues that have to do with gender. I haven't addressed race at all, which is essential to any discussion about criminalization and mass incarceration. Um, you know, I've talked about the challenges of doing a really long-term longitudinal study. I've touched on issues of illness, of families, of children. So I would really like to take questions and comments and open this up for more of a conversation and less of just me blabbering. We now have time for questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for Henrietta or myself to come to you with a microphone. As always, priority will go to students. All right, thank you so much for that talk. That was absolutely fascinating. You're um, you mentioned at one point that the women in halfway houses and shelters and prisons were discouraged from engaging in activism. Mm -hmm. um, I found that really interesting. So I was wondering if you could um, say like, how that manifested itself, um, why you think it is, and if there's any examples of women like trying to fight against that and engage in activism anyways? I think that's a fabulous question. Um, the, the mainstream ideology in all of these institutions is, um, it's kind of interesting, is gender sensitive programming. That's the catchphrase these days. And this gender sensitive programming so I'm really, I can only really speak about the women's stuff. 
I mean, men don't get gender sensitive programming. Gender is just a euphemism for saying women, which in itself is an issue. I mean, men are regular people and women are special, so they need gender sensitive programming. The gender sensitive programming is a kind of butchered version of Carol Gilligan's ideas about women in relationships. And the brilliant idea that they've come up with is that women's problems come from women not putting themselves first and caring too much about other people. So the, the catchphrase they hear over and over again is, I have to do me. I have to work on myself first. So one of the phrases that every single woman in the study had, can quote to me, and it's interesting because none of them have ever been in an airplane, but they'll say, you know how in the airplane the pilot says that if the oxygen masks come down, put your own on first and then put it on the other person afterwards? Well, well, that's what I need to do. I need to put on my own oxygen mask. So I said this is a bizarre metaphor for people who have never been on a plane. But the fact that they can recite it means they're hearing it everywhere. Um, so I think that there is somewhat of a, of a good intention of seeing that a lot of these women have been sucked into these awful relationships with men who abuse them. And um, the therapeutic goal is to build up their self-esteem so that they won't stay in these kinds of relationships. Um, I wish that in the men's prisons there were gender sensitive programming teaching the men to stop beating up women. I think it's more helpful to teach someone to stop being a perpetrator than to teach someone to stop being a victim. Um, and I think that the reality is that when you're homeless, you're going to be a target for abuse. So there isn't all that much sense even in talking about, I need to lose the victim mentality. But I think that one of the reasons that all of these institutions like that ideology um, is because I think in a deep way it resonates with core American beliefs about individualism and about personal responsibility. These are words that we like. These are ideas that we like. We Americans like to believe that each of us is captain of his or her own ship, that we're each masters of our own destiny. We don't like to think that luck and fate play important roles in our lives. The Kurdish women I worked with can sure as heck tell you how important luck and fate are, and they can tell you hundreds of rituals that you can do to try to turn your luck around and make your fate better. And those rituals, even if we can look at them and say, that's silly, that's ridiculous, you know, obviously, you know, lighting a candle and saying abracadabra is not going to cure cancer. But we can also say, wow, she always feels that there's something she can do to make her and her family situation better. Whereas the criminalized women, there's nothing they can do. Because all that they're told is work on yourself, work on yourself, work on yourself. But how can you work on yourself when everything around you is set up against you? So here's just a great example. All of the women have been in job training programs. And a lot of these job training programs um, center on teaching you how to have a job. So they begin with teaching you how to set an alarm clock so you can get to work on time. And at the graduation of a lot of these job training programs, they give them you know, business clothes. And I've even seen them get attache cases. You can't get a job if you have a criminal record. So you can work on yourself all you want and do 25 job training programs. But if no one's going to hire you because you have a criminal record, no one's going to hire you because you have a criminal record. So I think that putting the onus on the individual deeply resonates with these American ideologies that we're each captain of our own ship, but also takes the onus off of the larger public to think deeply about structural violence, to think about racism, to think about inequality, to think about living wages. Um, so yeah, the women really are discouraged. And when women even begin to hint at, you know, my husband's got to change what he's doing. The, whether it's the guard in the prison or whether it's the caseworker brings her back to, you can't change anybody else. All you can change is yourself. Um, that's a really great way to maintain the status quo. Um, what I do think is wonderful is there are a number of places around the country where formerly incarcerated men and women are 
joining together and developing their own activist organizations. And um, one of my fantasies actually is to do a study of um, a couple of these organizations and see how activism impacts people's chances of actually of staying out of the institutional circuit as time goes on. I think that's just a great question that you raised. Did I answer it or did I? Yeah. Okay, I didn't just circle around it too much. Hi. Oh, wow, that's loud. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, sure. That was fascinating. Um, okay. I'm wondering what experience, if any, you had with trans men and women um, in the prison system and out of the prison system mm -hmm. with or within this project. That's another really great question. As I'm sure many of you know, trans people are very overrepresented in prisons. Trans people are more likely to be arrested um, than non-trans people. And just like you hear about driving while black as a cause for arrest, walking while trans is sort of a phrase that's used. Um, so there's one trans woman in the study. In the book, I call her Ginger. Um, and um, her birth name was George. And um, I met her at a women's drop-in center. And it was a very interesting dynamic. Um, do you want to hear the personal story about her? Or do you want to hear the more the broader issues? Both? So it was kind of interesting. I, I, you know, we were doing this study of you know, formerly incarcerated women. And so here's Ginger, and she's coming into the women's center, you know, just on high heels and like blowing kisses to everyone and covered in makeup and you know, the whole drag queen thing. And um, so she came over to me after a week or two of my hanging out at this women's drop-in center, and she said, oh, can I be part of what you're doing? And you know, I didn't know what to do because it was a study of women, and she was so clearly not a woman, <coughs> or not a real woman, or not a regular woman. So I just kind of humored her, and um, I said, sure, sure. And you know, I did the intake interview with her, and I was pretty sure you know, things would you know, just sort of straighten themselves out and she'd move on to something else. So, you know, I saw her pretty regularly for a couple of months. She was coming to the Women's Center with a couple other trans women who were very into drag and they would come and sort through clothes that were donated to this Women's Center and, you know, look for you know, tight short shorts and the whole shtick. Anyway, after a couple of months, she just disappeared. And I didn't see her for about a month and I was asking everyone, have you seen Ginger? Have you seen Ginger? Do you know where she is? And um, no one knew where Ginger was. I assumed she was in jail. And then after about a month, she shows up again. And I say, where were you? She said, oh, my mother had hip replacement surgery. I was staying with her in the hospital. She has a brother. She's the only daughter in the family. So of course, who was going to stay with a mother who was having hip replacement surgery? The daughter. And I realized, yes, Ginger belongs in my study that for all purposes, she is a woman and she belongs in this study. Um, and interestingly, when we, when we did the sort of goodbye, and I'm still in touch with her almost every day, but when we did the formal goodbyes at the end of five years, for the first time she said to me, I just want you to know how much I appreciate that you considered me a woman for this project. She had never hinted at that over the five years. Um, so I know Ginger really well. I mean, we, as I said, we, talk almost every day. I think that she has survived her life because she has the most incredible people skills. She remembers my husband's birthday and calls me, she's never met him, and calls me up and says, tell your husband happy birthday for me. Um, she has her biological family that she's extremely close to, and then she has her, what she calls her gay family. So she has her trans mother and her trans daughter. So these are other trans women that she's been extremely close with for many, 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 many years. And I think these great social skills are why she has survived years and years and years on the streets. She talks to me about everything. I mean, we, yeah, I mean really intimate things. Um, the only thing she won't talk to me about is the first time she went to prison. And that time she was sent to the men's prison, the first time she was arrested. And she was in for about a year. So I know that many of the women don't tell me things that they think are going to upset me too much. And I also know that women don't tell the therapist things that they think will upset the therapists. It was actually Katya one day came into my office and said, 
<coughs> they'd assigned her a new therapist, which happens all the time, because at any of the um, city or state or county mental health centers, the only therapists they can get to work there are therapists in training, so they're constantly cycling in and out. So they have these 22-year-old girls working as therapists. And so Kati said, I couldn't, you should, I, I didn't want to make her cry. <laughs> I couldn't tell her the truth. So I assume that what happened to Ginger in jail in that year was so horrific that she didn't want to tell me about it. Um, I just know from what I've read that um, things are horrible for trans women in prison. You know, the amount of rape is just horrendous. Um, there's been a lot of litigation over trans people being able to get the hormones that they were taking. <coughs> um, anything more specific or that? Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Sure. Um, as someone who's sort of been involved um, in one way or another with sort of prisons and prison activism for a while, one of the things that sometimes I find difficult is this sense that I don't always know where to begin. It seems like such a huge, gigantic, impossible problem um, that it's difficult to know where to begin, especially in a world where for so long no one's really cared to even talk about prisons or there's no incentives for politicians to do anything about them. And so it seems like there, or I'm hopeful that there's beginning to be more sort of awareness, but I'm curious if you have any ideas about I mean, you sort of spoke to the idea that maybe the awareness we have right now is almost a sort of toxic awareness that distracts from mm -hmm. what the actual sort of awareness of what mm -hmm. the problem needs to be. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious if you have any sort of things that you focus on or, or suggestions for mm -hmm. how to, um, you know, think about beginning to tackle such a gigantic problem and, and sort of preventing people from saying, well, that's just something that we can't deal with or that's just yeah. something that, yeah. you know, isn't even worth addressing because yeah. it's so hard to even imagine changing. Yeah, I, I think that's really a hard question. <laughs> um, you know, I think that there does seem to be a sense that incarceration rates are going down and will continue to go down. You know, there's all these bipartisan efforts um, a lot of it has to do with fiscal issues, that it's just unsustainable to be supporting these prisons. Here in California, they had to get people out of the state prisons because they were too overcrowded, so the feds made them do it. But they just put those people into county jails, so they didn't really cut down on incarceration rates. Um, in other states, there's talks of reopening the state mental hospitals that had been shut down in the early 70s under deinstitutionalization. So I don't really see that, you know, moving people from prison to jail or from jail to state mental hospitals as a meaningful shift. Um, I mean, in my classes, I often show the film One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest just to remind people what state mental hospitals were like because we, we keep hearing, oh, it was this deinstitutionalization that led to homelessness and that's why there's so much incarceration. No, I, you know, I think that the solutions are structural and I think that we can release hundreds of thousands of people from prison, but they have no place to go. And one of the things that I see, because I work with women, they on the whole spend very little time locked up in jail and prison. They spend much more time in either therapeutic or welfare kinds of institutions. But they deal with the men who spend more time in prison. And so I see what happened, these, these men get out of prison they have nowhere to go, they're not eligible for public housing, they're unemployable, and they are pissed as hell. They're enraged, they've come out of this incubator of violence and aggression and anger. And you know, I think as a society, we need to give serious thought to, well, if we open up the prison doors, there's gonna be a lot of pissed off, angry people who have nowhere to go nothing to do, and no hopes or possibilities in life. So I think that the addressing of mass incarceration has to happen on many levels, one of which is we have to stop locking up so many people. <laughs> Let's just say that. We, have, we just have to stop doing that. But we have to invest serious thinking, and I also believe serious public funding, into figuring out what to do with the, not one, but we're talking about two, and in some communities, three generations of men whose lives have been wrecked by incarceration. Um, 
my personal opinion is that many of the people who have lived through the prison industrial complex um, will probably never be able to hold down a normative job. Um, if they could get a job at McDonald's that still doesn't pay a living wage, besides which, um, you know, they're going to get into a fight with somebody because it's a crappy place to work and something is going to happen and someone's going to call them the N-word or they're going to call someone the N-word and something's going to happen and it's going to fall apart again. Um, I think we need to consider something like, um, what was it called during the Depression, the W? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I think we need to do. I think we need to establish an enormous network of what would essentially be government stipend work that would be real work, that would give people a sense of accomplishment and a sense of contributing to society um, with the understanding that this is not job training. This is not, you'll do this for a year and then you're gonna move on to a real job. But to acknowledge that the poison of mass incarceration um, has seeped so deeply into so many communities that we need to be looking at several decades worth of ways of just managing these large numbers of people and then prevent it from happening again. So, you know, seriously address the school to prison pipeline is, you know, one of the things that I would talk about. You know, it's interesting. When I was telling you before that the women all learn in these programs that I need to do me and I need to take care of myself first. In our formal interviews, one of the questions that we ask them is, what do you think is your best qualities? Almost all of the women said, I'm generous and I like to help people. And um, one of the questions that we would ask them in the um, structured interviews every three months was, what is the worst thing that happened to you in the past few months and what's the best thing that happened to you in the past few months? Very often, the best thing that happened to you was an incident in which she helped somebody else. So. I think that there is a desire among many people <coughs> to help other people, to be connected, to be part of a society. Um, so that's what, that's not a panacea, you know? I think that when, when people have been locked up in cages for decades, you know, my mother-in-law was a concentration camp survivor. Did she go on to have a normal life? Yeah, she had a job, she got married, she had children. Um, it was certainly in an environment where no one blamed her, that it was seen as she was a victim of external causes, though of course in Israel, there was that little double-edged sword that, you know, if we wouldn't have gone like sheep to the slaughter, you know, we would have been stronger. But um, was she ever happy in her life? No, she was never happy. There was not a day in her life that she was happy. Did she have moments of happiness here and there? Yeah. But she never went on to have a good life. She had an okay life. And I think that's something that we as a society are gonna to have to grapple with, that there are hundreds of thousands of people who have been deeply, deeply, deeply damaged. And um, you know, we certainly need to do things like change laws that prohibit people with records from moving into public housing. And we have to do that, there's no doubt in my mind, but that's not enough. I think we need to put huge resources into family reunification. So many families have been split up by incarceration. Um, so those are some of the ideas that I have, and you know, they're hard, and they're all going to be expensive. But probably nothing is as, is as expensive as keeping people in prison. Well, other questions? Um, I had one myself. Mm -hmm. So. You briefly touched on this uh, during your speech, but I wanted to ask how many of the women in your study were mothers, and how did that contribute to their um, experiences like in the prison system and like yeah. in this? So era? almost all of them are mothers. And um, there, when they would go to prison, a number of different things could happen. Um, if they were fortunate, um, there was a father who would have the kids or there were grandparents who would have the kids. Um, but in a lot of cases, the problemed families are already several generations deep. So kids are put into the foster care system, they're put up for adoption. 
This is devastating to the mothers. Um, more than one woman said to me, you know, I know I'm an addict, but I never use drugs in front of my kids. And, you know, they always had enough to eat and they always had a roof over their heads. And, but when I was arrested and they took my kids away, I was just off and running. That, you know, whatever they'd been able to keep under control in terms of the, the drug use, just it, it, when they lost their kids, it was, it was devastating. And I'm, you know, because I'm already thinking about my mother-in-law. I just want to share one of the things that she said to us. She lost her, um, both of her parents and her siblings in the Holocaust. And I remember her saying to me years ago that um, the people who never were able to get their lives onto any kind of even okay track are the mothers who lost their children. So the children who lost their parents, yes, she was miserable her whole life, but she eked by. This is what I see in these women. It's, it's a hole in their hearts that their children are taken away from them. And, um, you know, I think that we have this fantasy that, you know, a mother who truly loves her child will say, well, my child would do better with this nice middle class family that could give my kid a safe and stable home and piano lessons and soccer club. But the reality is that these kids are put into foster care, into situations that are as bad, if not worse, than the situations that they came from. And more than one woman in this study had her kid return to her because the kid was assaulted or abused in foster care. So now she's a good enough mother. Now that the 10-year-old was raped, now she's a good enough mother to have the kid back. So that's the reality of the kind of stuff that goes on. Um, something else that I wasn't aware of um, until I began the project is that um, when the kids turn 18, they can come back to their mothers. So a lot of the women will talk about that, well, my son is back in my life, my daughter is back in my life, and they're really happy to have their kids back in their lives. But think about this dynamic. An 18-year-old who has been in foster care and juvenile facilities, and the rate of psychiatric medication in these, both in foster care kids and, and juvenile facilities is astronomical, is all of a sudden on the mother's doorstep. The mother is broke. She herself just got out of jail. She probably has substance abuse challenges. She certainly has health challenges. And she hasn't grown up as a parent together with the child. Um, it's just explosive. It's, it's, and I, you know, I've, I've been with the women as they go from just the heights of ecstasy that my child's back in my life, this child that they still think of as the five-year-old who's now an 18-year-old who's running the streets and doing all the same stupid stuff that the mother did when she was that age. Um, I would say that children and mothering is the most important issue for all of the women. For, I, I think of the 47 women, 45 had children or 44. That is the thing they care about the most. So. Any other questions? I've blabbered a lot. Anybody want to fight with me about any of my theories? <laughs> um, I have a question about the mental health uh, state of America. Mental health? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just went up to San Francisco to visit my daughter up at USF. She couldn't get in here. Sorry. <laughs> but, <laughs> I know in my heart of hearts that these people are mentally ill. Mm. I mean, you know, just from sitting on the street, shooting mm -hmm. up, and to just pushing baskets with no end game. Mm. So you made a statement regarding, mm. oh, the mental health institutions were closed at a certain time under a certain administration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've seen, I've seen being, we're mm. about the same age, a dramatic change in our inner city with the skid row, um, you know, the damages of drugs. How can we address the mental health issue mm -hmm. that seems to be glazed over right here? Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's really a good question. And, um, you know, I think that one of the questions that I would begin by asking is why are there such high rates of mental illness? <coughs> so that's, 
I mean, that, that's a real legitimate question to ask. Is that true in every society? Has it been true throughout time? Or are there aspects of how we live in America in the 21st century that are pushing people over the edge? But let me just bracket that for a minute. You know, with deinstitutionalization in the late 60s and early 70s, I mean, that was part of the civil rights movement and the women's movement, and it was part of an idea that you know, people have rights, people have inherent human rights, and people were locked up in state mental hospitals for decades, and the keys were thrown away. So when deinstitutionalization became the policy in most states, not it didn't happen in all states, it did not happen in Mississippi, for example, um, the idea was that um, mental health services would, would be made available in the communities. So people would be able to get mental health services in the communities. And then a bunch of things happened. One of them was that money was just not made available for that, that network of mental health centers to develop. Um, in terms of inpatient mental health care, so you know, supervised housing or group homes, that's when Not In My Backyard started. People didn't want these kind of group homes in their neighborhoods. So there was just a lack of funding for services and a lack of residential um, solutions for people who couldn't really live on their own. Um, in the states that have better networks of group home and um, assisted living type facilities, there are fewer people in Skid Row and sitting out on the streets begging. You don't see the numbers in Massachusetts that you see in Los Angeles. Now, part of the reason is that states like Massachusetts ship a lot of their mentally ill people off to California. But, <laughs> you know, they might not do it consciously, but I think that does, you know, the warmer climate is appealing to people in the winters. But um, in Massachusetts, you see very few people just living on the streets that we pretty much have enough shelter spaces for everybody. Another thing to think about is a chicken and the egg question, which is I think there's a presumption that these people are mentally ill, and because they're mentally ill, they're homeless and on Skid Row. But I would want to suggest that even as a thought experiment, we try to live on the streets and in shelters for a couple of months and see how crazy that makes us. I think it would make most of us pretty crazy. So it's not clear to me that the mental illness is the core problem. I think that the homelessness then pushes people into situations of such chronic and intense insecurity that it's hard to stay sane. And um, you know, I think there's been a lot of um, pushing of the idea that homelessness is caused by mental illness. But it's really not. Homelessness really is caused by housing prices. Um, and we see across America that homelessness rates go up when rental housing becomes out of reach for low-income individuals and families. Um, so I think another piece of the picture was that um, there was a lot of hope that with new developments in psychiatric medication, we'd be able to solve this mental illness problem. And it's just turned out that that's not quite the case. I mean, there are really good medications, but they're not, you know, they're not like antibiotics where you have strep throat and you take your antibiotic and it's like a miracle. Three days later, you don't have strep throat anymore. So. You know, I think that's just another piece of it. Um, did I answer your question or talk in circles around it? I, yeah, I mean, I'm, I know. I mean, I, I see the people you're talking about. They do look pretty crazy. You see people with stringy, greasy hair talking to themselves. Um, you know, a lot of people that you're seeing on the streets were in prison. There's, there's grotesque overuse of solitary confinement in prison. There are very good studies that show that even a couple of days in solitary confinement can push someone who before that was mentally healthy into psychosis. High rates of veterans are on the streets. 
So I think PTSD is kind of a problematic term, but certainly a lot of these men have lived through real horrors and never were able to really get their lives back on track after military service. So again, yes, there is mental illness, but I don't think that there's a, a pill that's gonna treat mental illness and then the problem is gonna go away. There's all these other parts around it that have to do with, with housing and with having a place in society. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions tonight. Professor Serret's books will be available for sale outside the room tonight. So please, if you'd like to purchase a book, please go to the table outside. Please join me in thanking Professor Student Serret. Thank you. Thank you.